Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea. When did we beat Japan at anything? To disperse with 30 bullets within half a second. 30 magazine clip in half a second. Right now, if you Google the word idiot, a picture of Donald Trump comes up. I just did that. No. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Political Circus Weekly Podcast. I am your host, Mike Ursery, and this is episode number 30. Yes, we made it to number 30. 30 weeks, not counting the weeks that I haven't done a podcast. I've been doing this, and as always, I thank all of you for listening. I bring you this episode while you're out celebrating the Memorial Day weekend, whatever it is you're doing, the pools are opening up, probably doing some barbecues, whatever it is you're doing, I hope you're all doing it safely. Memorial Day, of course, is the day that technically kicks off the summer season, and it's also a day where people like myself will reflect on People that we served with, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, people that we served with that we lost, some people, some very close to me, I've lost either while we were on active duty or after they left the service. But I think one thing that everyone can take solace in over this Memorial Day weekend is that with this being a federal holiday, people in the government are not working until Tuesday. Yes, they got their early release on Friday and they took off and probably took them four hours to get out of D.C. anyway because traffic there is so horrible. But they won't be back until Tuesday. And honestly, another crazy week in the news cycle. More talk about impeachment. More talk about investigating the investigators. More talk about, well, this past week was Infrastructure Week, but what was really interesting about Infrastructure Week is that there really wasn't any talk about infrastructure. Supposedly, Donald Trump met with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, and they were supposed to talk about how they're going to fund this $2 trillion infrastructure initiative across the country. I have no idea how they're going to do that. That's $2 trillion. Wait, yeah, I do. (laughs) They're going to borrow it like always, (laughs) but that meeting never happened. They were supposed to meet. Now here's what, here's what's really. So before that meeting took place, Nancy Pelosi did an interview with reporters and she said that Donald Trump was doing a cover up. She didn't say what he was covering up, but she said that he is he is engaged in a huge cover up. What with his businesses, what with uh, another affair, maybe or she didn't say she just said that he's doing a cover up. And then she goes to this meeting with Chuck Schumer and they meet with Trump and According to reports, the meeting only lasted mere minutes, and then Trump got up and walked out, and then he did his own press conference with reporters, and if you saw this, you would have seen this giant, this giant poster board that he had sitting in front of his podium, and it was, so it it said, like it said, no collusion, no obstruction, and then it had all of these statistics from the Mueller investigation, like it had the cost, it had the length, it had the uh, number of interviews that Mueller conducted, the number of subpoenas. <laughs> so he gives this press conference and he he uh, reiterates about how there's no collusion and no obstruction, which the obstruction part is still up in, up for debate. In fact, that's the what this episode is about, not so much about each instance of obstruction of justice that Donald Trump committed. I'll go over some of those, but this is more about Justin Amash. I'm sure you, I'm sure you've seen his name in the news this week, but Trump does this press conference and I have never seen anything like this. 
then again, I've never seen a presidency like Donald Trump's either. This is, <laughs> to say the least, Trump is by far the most entertaining president that we have had. Now, there are some things that he has done, particularly involving his conduct, especially on social media, well, Twitter to be exact, that have made me want to rip my hair out. Other times I just look down and shake my head. But still, Trump is by far the most entertaining we've had possibly in the history of the United States. But as I said a few minutes ago, impeachment is back in the news. Impeachment is, I'm not saying it's on the table because right now it's not. Uh, Democrats who seem so intent on impeaching this president after they took control of the House and you know this was this was one of their main points during the Democratic Party's campaign leading up to the midterm elections was that they would was that one of their orders of business would be to investigate Donald Trump and then and then go forward with impeachment proceedings but here lately they've been backing away from that so i don't know if they're going to impeach Donald Trump at all because well Nancy Pelosi has said on a few occasions that Impeaching the president would only divide the country. I guess she forgot that we're already divided. But it just seems like they're not so gung-ho about impeachment anymore. But there was one Republican this week who said that Donald Trump's conduct during the Mueller investigation is worthy of impeachment. And that was the congressman, uh, congressman from Michigan Justin Amash, the man who is revered as a constitutional conservative, the man who is one of the original members of the House Freedom Caucus, the man who was elected at a time when the Tea Party first entered the scene, that Justin Amash, the same Justin Amash who will give his reasons for why he votes for a bill. The same Justin Amash who you look at his voting record and all of his votes have been to limit government and not increase it. Amash, you know, a lot of people call the GOP conservatives. Whenever you look at the way the GOP is these days, a lot of a lot of members of the party are not so much conservative anymore. Justin Amash, in my mind, is still a constitutional conservative. But he had his conclusions about the Mueller report, and he outlined those conclusions on this somewhat long Twitter thread on May 18th. That was a Saturday. He had four different conclusions after reading the report, and he starts off his thread by saying this. Here are my principal conclusions. One, Attorney General Barr has deliberately misrepresented Mueller's report. Two, President Trump has engaged in impeachable conduct. Three, partisanship has eroded our system of checks and balances. Four, few members of Congress have read the report. Now, I myself have not read the entire Mueller report. I've seen parts of it, but, you know, I'm busy. I have a lot of stuff to do, and that is like almost 500 pages. I have not sat down and read that report to be honest with you. So kudos to Justin Amash for actually doing it. So first off, whenever he says that few members of Congress have read the report, I 100% believe him on that. These are people who don't read bills before they vote on them. So why would they sit down and read a 500 page report? No. And you know what? They all in, you know, Amash talks about this later on in, in his thread, but they already had their own conclusions about the, about the Mueller investigation, investigation before this report came, became available. When he says partisanship has eroded our system of checks and balances, I absolutely 100% agree with that as well, completely. And then he says President Trump has engaged in impeachable conduct. And he outlines some, and he, he uh, lists some examples in his thread. He doesn't just say that and then just kind of leave everyone in the dust. You know, whenever he first said it, I was thinking to myself, I would like for him to to explain how he came to his conclusion on this, and he came through with it. So he begins explaining explaining his his principal conclusions. 
And one of the first things you said was that Attorney General Barr used sleight of hand qualifications or logical fallacies that he hoped people would not notice. And then he also says that under the Constitution, the President of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and convictions of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. He said that high crimes and misdemeanors is not defined in the Constitution, but the context implies conduct that violates public trust. And he said that President Trump had engaged in specific actions and pattern, patterns of behavior that meet the threshold for impeachment. And he cites obstruction of justice. He goes on to say that Americans, America's institutions depend on officials to uphold both the rules and spirit of our constitutional system even when to do so is personally inconvenient or yields a politically unfavorable outcome. He then went on to say this one thing that I really love. He said, our constitution is brilliant and awesome. It deserves a government to match it. Now, one defense against, against the notion that Donald Trump did in fact, uh, did in fact obstruct justice is that, there were no underlying crimes, and I believe it was Rudy Giuliani, who is now serving as one of Donald Trump's personal lawyers, who said that if there is no underlying crime, there is no obstruction of justice. Well, Amash has some things to tweet about that as well. Two days after first, after first saying that President Trump had engaged in impeachable conduct, he comes out with another tweet thread which was about that very thing. And he starts off saying people who say there were no underlying crimes and therefore the president could not have intended to illegally obstruct the investigation and therefore cannot be impeached are resting their argument on several falsehoods. One, they say there were no underlying crimes. In fact, there were many crimes revealed by the investigation, some of which were charged and some of which were not, but are nonetheless described in Mueller's report. Two, they say obstruction of justice requires an underlying crime. In fact, obstruction of justice does not require the prosecution of an underlying crime, and there is no logical reason for that. Prosecutors might not charge a crime precisely because obstruction of justice denied them timely access to evidence that could lead to a prosecution. If an underlying crime were required, then prosecutors could charge obstruction of justice only if it were unsuccessful in completely obstructing the investigation. This would make no sense. Three, they imply the president should be permitted to use any means to end what he claims to be a frivolous investigation, no matter how unreasonable his claim. In fact, the president could not have known whether every single person Mueller investigated did or did not commit any crimes. Four, they imply high crimes and misdemeanors require charges of a statutory crime or misdemeanor. In fact, high crimes and misdemeanors is not defined in the Constitution and does not require Require corresponding statutory charges. The context implies conduct that violates the public trust, and that view is echoed by the framers of the Constitution and early American scholars. And he's right. There were underlying crimes that were outlined in Robert Mueller's report. Paul Manafort sitting in prison right now for, for multiple convictions. Uh, Michael Cohen, Trump's former personal lawyer, who lied to Congress, is now sitting in prison. Michael Flynn, General Flynn, who lied to the FBI, who's not been sentenced yet, but, you know, these are crimes. There were underlying crimes. And some of the examples, you know, whenever whenever Mueller did this report, he did it in two volumes. One was pertaining to the actual investigation of colluding with the Russian government. And then the second one was about obstruction of justice. And he outlines examples of what of what he thought were what what he thought was obstruction of justice. There was like I think what maybe ten, maybe twelve. I don't know the exact number, but some of these pertain to the people. Some of the people I just mentioned, General Flynn and Cohen, to be exact. For example, in the part pertaining to FBI Director. Comey and Michael Flynn, Mueller wrote, in mid-January 2017, incoming National Security Advisor Michael Flynn falsely denied to the Vice President, other administration officials, and FBI agents that he had talked to Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak 
about Russia's response to U.S. sanctions on Russia for its election interference. On January 27th, the day after the president was told that Flynn had lied to the vice president and had made similar statements to the FBI, the president invited FBI Director Comey to a private dinner at the White House and told Comey that he needed loyalty. On February 14th, the day after the president requested Flynn's resignation, the president told an outside advisor, now that we fired Flynn, the Russia thing is over. It was just getting started, though. (laughs) The advisor disagreed and said the investigations would continue. Later that afternoon, the president cleared the Oval Office to have a one-on-one meeting with Comey. Referring to the FBI's investigation of Flynn, the president said, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He is a good guy. I hope you can let this go. Shortly after requesting Flynn's resignation and speaking privately to Comey, the president sought to have Deputy National Security Advisor KT McFarland draft an internal letter stating that the president had not directed Flynn to discuss sanctions with Kislyak. McFarland declined because she did not know whether that was true, and a White House counsel's office attorney thought that the request would look like a quid pro quo for an ambassadorship that had been offered. So there's one instance where now, now Trump did not just come out and tell Comey to end this investigation of Michael Flynn. He just said, I hope you can let this go. Now, the one part here that really bothers me is how he said that he told Comey that he expected loyalty you are a sitting president and you are telling the top law enforcement officer in the country that you expect him to be loyal to you. It's not how it's supposed to work. That is not how it's supposed to work at all. It's probably not the only president who's ever done that to FBI director or anyone else, but still that is just, that is a bad look. That is not good at all. And personally, I think that that is a gateway to tyranny right there. The director of the FBI is supposed to be loyal to his office and to his responsibilities, not to the person sitting in the White House. Another example in the Mueller report, conduct towards Flynn, Manafort, redacted, harm to ongoing matter. After Flynn withdrew from a joint defense agreement with the president and began cooperating with the government, the president's personal counsel left a message for Flynn's attorneys, reminding them of the president's warm feelings towards Flynn, which he said, still remains, and asking for a heads up if Flynn knew information that implicates the president. When Flynn's counsel reiterated that Flynn could no longer share information pursuant to a joint defense agreement, the president's personal counsel said he would make sure that the president knew that Flynn's actions reflected hostility towards the president. During Manafort's prosecution, and when the jury in his criminal trial was deliberating, the president praised Manafort in public and that Manafort was being treated unfairly and declined to rule out a pardon. After Manafort was convicted, the president called Manafort a brave man for refusing to break and said that flipping almost ought to be outlawed. So here we have Michael Flynn, who's doing what Michael Flynn is supposed to do at that point in the investigation. And he refused to to give Trump a heads up if he knew of any information that implicated the president. Michael Flynn did the right thing by not going along with that because he was already in hot water. Didn't want to be in any more. Didn't want to be in any deeper water. And then Trump takes that as Flynn being hostile towards him. This is that whole loyalty thing. Once again, it's like, if you do not, if, if you do not, how's the best way to put this? If you do not do what he wished to do, all of a sudden you are, hostile, you are unfriendly, you are not loyal, and I cannot stand that about this president. I cannot stand that at all. Another example, conduct conduct involving Michael Cohen. The president's conduct towards Michael Cohen, a former Trump organization executive, changed from praise for Cohen when he falsely minimized the president's involvement in the Trump Tower Moscow project to castigation of Cohen when he became a cooperating witness. From September 2015 to June 2016, Cohen had pursued the Trump Tower Moscow project on behalf of the Trump Organization and had briefed candidate Trump on the project numerous times, including discussing whether Trump should travel to Russia to advance the deal. 
In 2017, Cohen provided false testimony to Congress about the project, including stating that he had only briefed Trump on the project three times and never discussed travel to Russia with him in an effort to adhere to a party line that Cohen said was developed to minimize the president's connections to Russia. While preparing for his congressional testimony, Congress had extensive discussions with the president's personal counsel, who, according to Cohen, said that Cohen should stay on message and not contradict the president. After the FBI searched Cohen's home and office in April 2018, the president publicly asserted that Cohen would not flip, contacted him directly to tell him to stay strong, and privately passed messages of support to him. Cohen also discussed pardons with the president's personal counsel and believed that if he stayed on message, he would be taken care of. But after Cohen began cooperating with the government in the summer of 2018, the president publicly criticized him, called him a rat, and suggested that his family members had committed crimes. Oh boy, this one is... So, Cohen pursued the Trump Tower Moscow project on behalf of the Trump organization and had briefed candidate Trump on the project numerous times, including discussing whether Trump should travel to Russia to advance the deal. Trump's personal counsel tells Cohen that he should stay on message when giving his congressional testimony. So I don't necessarily think that this is Trump just coming out and telling Cohen to lie to the FBI because I was not any part of that communication. So I can't say definitively that that is what happened, but for his lawyers to be telling Cohen to stay on message before giving his congressional testimony, he's testifying under oath. He is testifying under oath, and you're telling him to stay on message. And Justin Amash, in another long tweet thread, also cited some examples. Like, for example, he tweeted, after AG Sessions, that's Jeff Sessions, recused himself from the Russian investigation on the advice of Department of Justice ethics lawyers, Trump directly asked Sessions to reverse his recusal so that he could retain control over the investigation and help the president. Trump directed the White House counsel, Don McGahn, to have special counsel Mueller removed on the basis of pretextual conflicts of interest that Trump's advisors had already told him were ridiculous and could not justify removing the special counsel. When the event was, when that event was publicly reported, Trump asked that McGahn make a public statement and create a false internal record stating that Trump had not asked him to fire the special counsel and suggested that McCann would be fired if he did not comply. Trump asked Corey Lewandowski, his former campaign manager, to tell Sessions to limit the special counsel's investigation only to future election interference. Trump said Lewandowski should tell Sessions he was fired if he would not meet with him. Trump used his pardon power to influence his associates, including Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen, not to fully cooperate with the investigation. Trump, through his own statements, such as complaining about people who flip and talk to investigators and through communications between his personal counsel and Manafort and Cohen, gave the impression that they would be pardoned if they did not fully cooperate with investigators. Manafort ultimately breached an agreement to cooperate with investigators, and Cohen offered false testimony to Congress, including denying that the Trump Tower Moscow project had extended to June 2016 and that he and Trump had discussed traveling to Russia during the campaign. That was the stay on message part. Both men have been convicted for offering false information and Manafort's lack of cooperation left open some significant questions, such as why exactly he provided an associate in Ukraine with campaign polling data, which he expected to be shared with a Russian oligarch. Some of the president's actions were inherently corrupt. Other actions were corrupt and therefore impeachable because the president took them to serve his own interest. The president has authority to fire federal officials, direct his subordinates, and grant pardons, but he cannot do so for corrupt purposes. Otherwise, he would always be allowed to shut down any investigation into himself or his associates, which would put him above the law. So there you have it. He outlined all of his reasons for how he came to his conclusions, his conclusions, and he explained them just like I was hoping that he would. Well, a day later... Trump had some Trump had already caught wind of what Amash did and Trump responded to this in the way that only Trump knows how by trashing him on Twitter. He took to the Twitterverse 
and said that he was never a fan of Justin Amash. He also said that Amash was looking for attention. He called Amash weak, and he also called Amash a loser. You know, Trump would do himself so many favors if he got off Twitter. Look, I'm not saying that he has to delete his Twitter account, but just don't use it the way that he's been doing it because that just makes himself look worse. Look, if you want to, like, if the president of the United States, President Trump, wants to have a Twitter account, yeah, he can keep his regular account up, the at real Donald Trump, but, you know, use it for presidential announcements, such as if he's going to sign a bill into law, if he's going to make a presidential visit, if he's doing something pertaining to a federal holiday, use it for official presidential announcements. And that's it. That's it. He also would have done himself a lot of favors by not doing all these things that he did during the Mueller investigation, because, you know, now we're having this obstruction of justice conversation and, you know, nothing is probably going to happen from this. I imagine it's just going to, I imagine nothing's ever going to happen. Um, but you know, I'm sure there's certainly a lot of debate about whether or not this constitutes as obstruction of justice. But some of these things like telling Michael Cohen to stay on message before a congressional testimony, telling Paul Manafort not to cooperate with the investigation. And not only that, but just, you know, all this stuff that he did, like going on Twitter and calling this a witch hunt and saying that it's being carried out by 18 ang angry Democrats and about how they just want to delegitimize his presidency and just, you know, that he did for those 22 months, he would have done himself so many favors. And if he had not done all that, we would not be having this conversation right now. We would have gotten the one volume that said that Trump did not collude with the Russia government, the Russian government to influence or even steal the 2016 election. And that would be it. But he was not the only one who was criticizing Amash. Kevin McCarthy, who is the House Minority Leader, he came out and also said that Amash was looking for attention. He also said that Amash voted with Pelosi more than he voted with McCarthy. Well, that's not entirely true because according to 538.com, who actually tracks this kind of stuff, they track, they track the way that people in the government vote. And if you look at Amash's voting record, yeah, 538.com is very analytics driven. And you like you get to it by actually spelling out 538 instead of just, you know, instead of just 538.com, you actually have to spell out 538. But go take a look at their website if you haven't. It's really interesting. A lot of numbers, a lot of analytics. But, you know, when you go through some of the stuff that they do, it's it's pretty cool. But whenever you look at this. So in 20 with during the last during the last Congress from from 2017 up until January of 2019, Amash voted with, well, it says with Trump, but this meaning with the GOP, meaning that he voted the way how how Trump favored. So if like Trump opposed and if he voted no, then he's voting with Trump. If Trump favored it and he voted yes, then he was voting with Trump. He did this 62% of the time. That's a majority. So far, from January until now, he has voted with Trump 92% of the time. So this saying that he votes with Pelosi more often than he votes with McCarthy is not true, obviously. And Amash even told reporters this because they had caught up with him and were asking questions about all this stuff. And he said... McCarthy is lying, and then he said, that's typical Kevin. Even Amash's own caucus, the House Freedom Caucus, condemned what he did unanimously. Wow. So he's caught quite a bit of heat. But, you know, as far as this whole, this whole crying out for attention thing, you realize that Amash has not gone on any new shows. Yes, these reporters caught up with him and they were asking him questions and he was answering them while he was walking. He didn't tell them much, but he just kind of explained himself. But there was one thing that he did do. 
a group of eighth graders from Michigan were visiting the Capitol and he spoke to all of them and he was talking to them about principles and he was talking to them about his own principles, which I think is great. I think it's very enlightening. And I also think it's very relieving to see someone who not only actually does this, not only sticks to his principles, but actually is sharing this with the next generation. Yeah, in case you haven't noticed, I am a fan of Justin Amash. But there is one constitutional conservative in the Senate who also came out and said that Amash is wrong. He did not deliver any falsehoods. He did not come out and say, I condemn Amash for doing this. No, this is Rand Paul, another person in Congress that I like. Um, so this, he did an interview with the Huffington Post and he was, he just said that he thought that Amash got it wrong by saying that Trump committed obstruction of justice and that he should be impeached for it. And he went on to call the Mueller report, the antithesis of libertarianism. And he told the Huffington Post, I actually think the libertarian position on the investigation is, you know, libertarians. We've been very, very critical of the intelligence community having too much power, including Congressman Amash has said, you know, really, you should have to get a warrant before you get an American's records. Of course, here he's talking about how how the intelligence community spied on the Trump campaign leading up to the election. So you have Amash saying one thing. You have Paul saying one thing, and if you ask yourself, well, who here is right? Well, in a way, they're both right because, yeah, the intelligence community should not have so much power that they can spy on Americans without a warrant. We've gone over this so many times. Um, not saying that, you know, if you come out and say that Amash is right or wrong, that is going to be up to interpretation. But, you know, he at least he at least explained himself. He explained himself, and he did it thoroughly. He did it in a way that makes sense. And this is this is very in character for Justin Amash. I would say that Congress should, or at least you know, the House, who has the impeaching authority, should at least take a look at this and come to a conclusion about this. But as Amash said, the that our institutions are so divided by partisanship. Look, even, even the Democrats who are coming out against impeachment now would still love to impeach the president if they had a reason to. Why are they backing away from impeachment now? I don't know. This could be maybe related to the new investigation that is taking place, and that is investigating the investigators, which is being led by William Barr now in an effort to find out how this Russia narrative started, who started it, who ordered the spying of the Trump campaign, and all of these people who were involved in this, what was their role, and did they commit any crimes? So the Russia, despite Mueller's report coming out, and now that we know that there is no Russian collusion involving the Trump campaign, the investigation is not over with. It has simply been flipped. Oh, and also, you know, as far as people criticizing Justin Amash, it now seems that he is going to have a primary challenger ahead of the next the next election in 2020. He is going to be primaried by a Michigan state representative named Jim Lower. And Lower did this interview with Laura Ingram on the Ingram Angle on Fox News. And he had said that there was one thing here that he said. Now, Lower is a very pro-Trump guy, but one thing here that he said was that Amash aligns more with Rashida Tlaib than he does with the GOP. Dude, shut up. <laughs> no, he does not. Come on. Look, okay, yeah, Rashida Tlaib, Democrat from Michigan, does, in fact, very much does want to impeach Donald Trump. In fact, after she was elected, she was at a private party and she was on video saying, we're going to impeach the mother fill in the blank. Look, Rashida Tlaib is dead set on impeaching Donald Trump. And she has been since she got elected actually before she got elected, but yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think it matters what for, I think she would impeach Donald Trump for anything, to be honest with you. Amash just said that Trump committed impeachable conduct, and he did this after reading the Mueller report and 
after however long, however much time of critical thinking that that he put with this report, and then he came to his conclusions, and then he spelled them out. Now, Rashida Tlaib did did reach out to Amash, and she told him that she wanted him to sign on this impeachment resolution. He has not responded to that. But look, there's there's a difference between Rashida Tlaib and Justin Amash. Justin Amash thinks that Donald Trump actually committed a crime. Rashida Tlaib just hates Donald Trump. So that's not the same thing. And no, he does not al- align with Rashida Tlaib. That is completely stupid. I think Jim Lohr just finally got a national platform and all of a sudden here he's the one who's crying out for attention because he's going to pri- primary the incumbent cron- congressman in his district. There's also been some talk that Amash might run for president. Uh, there's also been talk that he might leave the Republican Party, join the Libertarian Party and run for president. Personally, I don't think he should do that. Look, you know, Donald Trump's running for re-election in 2020. And I really don't think anyone can beat him. I really, I don't even think a Democrat could beat him because they're all beating up on each other and they're all so consumed by identity politics and they're even eating their own. Like I just, I think whoever comes out of this democratic primary is going to be so battered that they're not going to really have much of a chance to defeat Trump. I do not think that Justin Amash running as a libertarian would really have any chance to defeat Trump. If Amash wants to run for president, I'm pretty sure he hasn't made up in his mind that he would wait until 2024 and then he would join the, he would throw his hat in a ring and be a part of the Republican primary. Um, There's been, as far as all this talk about him joining the Libertarian Party, if he said that there, if there is any recruiting effort, he doesn't know anything about it and he hasn't heard anything about it. So if he's going to run for president, I don't think he's going to do it just yet. I think he very I think he could, but just not right now. But that is all the time that I have for in this episode. I went a little a little longer than I usually do. I try to keep these to about 30 35 minutes. This is going to be around 40 minutes. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, the Political Circus Weekly podcast is a part of the Think Liberty Network. You can find us the Think Liberty Network on so many podcatchers, whichever one you like to use. And as I've said before, if there's one that we're not on that you like to use, let us know. I will see you all again next week. Thank you so much for listening. Have a happy and safe Memorial Day. Goodbye, everyone. And thing sucks. <laughs>